And I believe we are here, delayed but not defeated. Once again, another episode of Legends of the Drowned Isles, The Great Confusion. An alternative game from the regular game, taking a break, because not all of us can be online all the time, as uh, it has become <laughs> the standard for everyone for the last 18 years. Uh, this is a 5th edition D&D &D homebrew campaign. I'm your host and GM. I'm Mark the Encaffeinated One. I'm, I'm, I was going to close the curtain, but I'm kind of digging the glow I have uh, from the sunlight coursing across my, uh, my beard here. Uh, this is a campaign set in my homebrew world of Omatia, 1,000 years before uh, the uh, campaign previously set in a world on the edge of confusion. That's why it's called The Great Confusion. I came up with an excuse in everything. Better yet, I have my players, starting on my left with Pat. My name is Pat. <clears throat> I am playing Silas Marsh, uh, <clears throat> uh, cultist, uh, illusionist, and trainee guitarist. And coughist, I think, from what we're seeing. Cough, cough, cough. Uh, I am Marie. I am playing Annie, who is a rogue. I'm Nax, and I'm playing um, Medric, half-orc cleric. I thought for sure you were going to say, I'm Medric, I'm playing Nax, yeah. the cosplayer. <laughs> uh, well, let us take a little uh, a little detour. I will have to summarize this on the fly, because I wrote a summary of the last episode, and it's a, almost two pages long. I'm not sure what happened with that. Let's see here. Previously... Battered and beaten, the group fought alongside Captain Verandell against the remnants of the Sea Devil Raiding Party. Stepping into an opportunity, the glowing blade Vice in her hand, and he dispatched one of the water elements that had caused so much harm. The other one fled into a nearby public outhouse, which lost down the drain. The rest of the Sea Devils responded to the horn call heard reverberating across the town, some sort of signal, and attempted to flee, but were cut down by the remaining guards and eventually by Captain Verandell on his horse. The fighting concluded for a moment, and Silas took a second to check on the guards and others wounded by the battle. One of them was beyond his help, but another revived on his own. Verandell went off to check another part of town to check in with his guards. The group took a brief moment to look at the package one of the sea devils had dropped. Inside they found a stone vase glazed with a shiny black finish, a simple band of runes inlaid around its center are small gems studded on the outside. From what they could determine, it had no particular value or significance, aside from being an object of art. The group gathered themselves, weary and wounded, and walked to the far side of town, directly toward where the familiar and friendly glow of the Everflame Tower at the Temple of Ignis normally glowed. Now, however, it was ominously dark. Along the way, the streets were dim, and the rain from heavy clouds poured down on them, making the cobblestone slick and dirt alleys full of mud. The way was empty, except for strange bundles which lay to the sides of the streets. On closer look, the group discovered these bundles to be bodies of dead citizens and guards, even a few of the sea devils and crab people. Each of them seemed carefully arranged, their bodies straightened and faces upright, arms folded gently across their stomachs, eyes closed. Otter still on the toes of each of them was affixed a folded wooden tag with simple runic words burned into each of them. One of them read, Study, and another, Bury, another said, Revive, and a fourth kind varied with the word, Salvage, burned into the wood, and another word heavily but elegantly scribed beside it. In one case, it read, Hands. The group continued on, collecting several of these tags as they went. Finally, they rounded the corner and turned onto the street where the temple should be. Debris of bro broken and burned stone lay strewn across the block that surrounded the temple. The streets were blocked by, this, by the remains of several buildings which had been destroyed. The area steamed still, and a vague warmth still projected from the area. The group picked their way over the rubble carefully. On the inside was a crater of destruction, with the collapsed Temple of Ignis at its center. No light came from within, and nothing moved except a barely-seen, oddly-shaped figure standing beside a boxy cart on the far side of the mess. The group approached the figure, but as they grew closer, their sh the shape continued to confuse. 
while the general body seemed that of a dwarf, and the thick knotted beard and wide brow confirmed it, the figure stood taller than most of those kin, and its shoulders, arms, and hands seemed enormously out of size of the rest. It placidly watched them approach, even waving to them. His fell face held a larger-than-normal right eye, although a deep scar crawled across that face, along that side, and the eye was milky. He seemed unable to truly speak, but seemed to understand what they were saying. In a second they heard a light, cheery voice call from within the rubble. He called out for help from Dover. With a creature, apparently named Dover's help, the group managed to make their way into the structure through a nearly collapsed door. In the center, they discovered a well-coiffed and smiling gnome, checking over the still body of Flame Keeper Tidewell. They extracted the body and chatted with the strange little man, discovering that he was responsible for the tags and the collection of the dead. To Tidewell's toe, he had attached Barry, which Medrick crossed over with a little flame and wrote in Burn instead. Although they were suspicious of him, Dr. Marigold assured him that his papers were all in order. He also suggested that he studies the dead in order to help the living, such as his friend, Dover. All the while, and as soon as they had entered the ring of destruction around the temple, there was a sense of being watched, and with most of them catching a fleeting glimpse of someone disappearing down an alley. Flames erupted around Tidewell's form, and a humanoid angel of living flame emerged and spoke with her voice. It spoke distantly, as if no longer seeing the world around it as it is. It told Medric to be wary, but to have hope to be strong, but not to hold hatred. She spoke of several things, on the themes of caution, of warning, of prediction, far-sight, vision, and comfort, and finally speaking with the words of Ignis itself. Then it vanished. Marigold asserted something else, too. In his professional experience, while Tidewell had some wounds, her death was more consistent with drowning. And finally... The group found Gaetano, who had been thrown through a wall, but had resisted drowning. Now, time has passed. Two weeks, approximately. We'll catch up with the characters and what they've done, but a few things to note. First of all, congratulations to all the characters. They've now leveled up to level five. A few notes about the general stories you would have heard about town. First of all, the storm persists over the town. It seems to persist over the entire valley, ending roughly with Cape Raven, where the Baron and Baroness's home is, although there is still heavy mist and cloud around the area, not quite the full storm. To the south, it ends just before the dead man's fingers, meaning the lighthouse, with its weak light, is able to still project. You also de donated, I believe, the uh, remains of the uh, Star Stone to Jonas, who assured that you could, he could use his device that he created to try to focus it, even the little bit of power that remains, to produce a brighter light than he could with only oil. The rain and clouds and storm persisted. After about a week, the rain died down a little bit, but the clouds were thick, reducing the sun to nothing more, even at its brightest, than a silvery white disk, one that you could, in fact, stare at, even through the clouds. It seems that Ignis is far away from the town. Of the 37 guards, 23 were killed that night, and all but four of the remainder suffered grievous wounds that took time to heal. That number includes the eight house guards of the Baron and Baroness who joined the fight, of which there are now only five. Only eight other people died. Some were not discovered until days later, when the smell of their bodies wafted through their neighbors. Two of them were killed in the street, but the remainder were found in ransacked buildings. Around the temple, eleven small buildings were destroyed in the blast wave that must have centered from there. That included four shops, two boarding houses, and two pubs, as well as several smaller residences. In all, over 60 people were displaced, but miraculously, none of them died. Uh, let's see. A couple of other notes. 
uh, you had found down by the docks, or rather, your rocky friend, Graveler, had picked up a couple of things when told to go after the stone. They were a couple of items of shiny relevance, at least it would seem to Graveler. One was a broken necklace with pearls. New, it may have fetched quite a significant price. As it is, inquiring a little bit, you've discovered that it might be sold for 20 gold pieces in its current form. You also found a silver ring. The ring was untarnished, and the silver seems to be solid and pure. After cleaning it off, you discover that it is broader than a human finger, and imagine it's probably sized for a dwarf. There appears to be a family crest on the top in the rough shape of a shrewd eye. It also looks like a gem was once affixed in the center, but no gem remains. In simple weight, it's only about 20 silver pieces in common silver weight, but probably worth more as an art object to the right buyer, or maybe to the right family. May I roll to see if I recognize the crest? Certainly. That would be history, right? Yes. Uh, that would be a 13. 13? There are a lot of dwarven clans, big and small. This one you would recognize if you saw it again, but it's probably oh. regional. It's certainly not a very well-known one. Is there anything I recognize from the town? Um, are there any dwarves in the town? Uh, there are a scattering of dwarves. Most of the dwarves are in the nearby uh, mountainside. Uh, which is, I've got it here somewhere. Uh. Oh, weird, it's not in that particular one. <laughs> uh, but you can roll history as well uh, with the opportunity to try to figure out what that is. When that, uh, where did that go? That's weird. Would I have seen it in my travels anywhere? Uh, you can make a history at disadvantage. Um, as as you would have been talking and kind of handing the stone, this uh, ring back and forth, uh, Annie probably would have mentioned that she doesn't recognize it. It's probably local, which makes it less likely that you would you would recognize it. Okay. Um, history. Oh, that's already a minus one. <laughs> yeah, disadvantage. <laughs> okay, never yeah. seen that in my life you've seen some pretty like impressive eyes. rings um I, I have eyes i mean my, my compatriots have eyes could be ours <laughs> um, it's weird because i know it's very I, much not mine. I know i wrote this down this is what's really weirding me out is i can't find uh that okay well i have one part of the answer and i will find the rest when i uh when I do, um, but uh, Silas, you you recognize it um, uh, at least vaguely. Um, you've seen dwarves who've come into town with uh, emblems like that. Um, there is a a mountainside with oh that's what I'm looking for. Ah, there's a mountainside uh, called Dem Thurim not far away, with a uh, town called Thurim Hall at its base. Uh, and you think it's one of the the uh, clans that, that works there. Okay. Uh, it was probably lost um, on the, the docks. The circumstances that you can't really know. Uh, unfortunately, the gem being missing in the center uh, reduces the actual value of that gem or that uh, ring to sell it to a common uh, peddler. It is well made and solid, uh, and it has the right weight um, for, for proper silver. Um, so, you have a couple of weeks to, to yourselves, essentially. And during those couple of weeks, people in the town are, well, to be honest, nervous. People do go out still. It takes them a while after a couple of days of essentially being uh, uh, hiding away from whatever might be in the streets. 
by the time most people have emerged the next day, those few bodies that were in the street are gone. You imagine Dover and Dr. Marigold had been very busy that night trying to make sure that these bodies were removed from sight. Nonetheless, as I said, a few were discovered later. The talk of the town is partially cursing the sea devils for their attack and also partially wondering what could have brought them on. What brought them here? With the destruction of the Ignean Temple, a lot of eyes turn that way. On Medrick, you find a lot of suspicious people who turn away as you walk by. Nobody seems to say much, but you get that feeling that there's a bit of blame heading your way. At the same time... Yeah, I'll ignore those people for now and those looks. At the same time, there are sympathetic voices. A number of people stop you in the street and say how much they actually liked Tidewell. The flamekeeper helped them out of a jam or kept them warm on a cold winter night. The door was always open, apparently. Most people didn't go in. And Tidewell was not a great uh, evangelist, so none of them necessarily worship Ignis. They more respected Tidewell, if anything. Do you arrange for any sort of public funeral? Her body was, I believe, destroyed and consumed by the fire that, that uh, grew up from it, but... I guess I thought I... I thought it was just her spirit that went up into flames and her body was still there, because I remember uh, telling Dr. Mary Gold to, like, not touch that yeah. one. Oh, yes. Yeah, the body yeah. was still there. Sorry, you're right. It was... It yeah, was so I'll put up an ad... I'll put up an ad like on, well, I'm assuming there's like an ad board as well as a job board. I Maybe. mean, there are, there are numerous places and different pubs where they'll hang signs for people looking for work or, or yeah. looking to, to hire people. So I would just uh, put a few signs there a few days ahead of when the funeral is going to happen. Kind of realize that's primarily up to you. Yeah. So probably um, like two days after, or the, the day after the attack, basically. What do you do with her body in the meantime? Yeah, that's the reason. I don't want to leave the body around, out there for too long. I don't want Dr. Marigold to touch it. <laughs> so do you just leave it there for two days? No, I mean the day after the attack. Okay. Like that, that's when it... Like, like okay. Yeah. So the funeral is going to be the next morning, which I mean, like, I realize there's not going to be that many people there, but I'd rather get this done quickly. Okay. Yeah. Um, make a survival roll. Oh, sorry, make a right. nature roll. Nature. Where's the chaos? Uh, close it. Nature? Yes, indeed. Oh, that's better than expected. Okay. With my minus one. Despite the heavy rain and ever-present wind, um, you realize that a body lying open like this is going to be in danger of being attacked by wild animals. Or even just the the uh, ubiquitous rats, feral dogs, and whatever else might roam the streets. But you do hear howling at night on a couple of those occasions. Um, I will say that you took a bit of, of, uh, of a step to probably cover over the body with some of the rubble of the temple itself. Oh, yeah. to keep it uh, somewhat safe and preserved for, for those couple of days. Cool. Even after... Um, a few days, or even after the, the two weeks, very little really has been done to, to pull down uh, the buildings and the debris that's piled up around there. Every time you visit Medrick, you kind of realize just what kind of a maelstrom of storms must have happened here. Um, it's like the center of a tornado uh, having kind of blown outward. Uh, there's signs of so much of the wood being blackened and burned, but also shredded and torn. 
um, the the fight here was not uh, meek. It was not simple. Um, it's clear that the flame keeper fought with everything she had, but was just taken over by overwhelming force. People tend to avoid this spot right now. Uh, who would I have to request permission to to have the temple revealed? Probably the Baron and Baroness. Okay. There's no mayor here. Um, they are the ultimate people in charge. So I would ask, uh, well, who got, was it Captain Verindale who got us in with the Baron the first time? Yes. Yeah. So I, I'd request the Captain Verindale to set up an appointment with myself and the Baron at some point in the indeterminate future, preferably sooner rather than later. So I, till I get the permission to rebuild the temple, basically. Um, it's not my place to uh, book appointments with the Baron or Baroness. Uh, there is a Chamberlain that sometimes comes to town. Um, I would suggest that you take up that issue with them. Besides, in the meantime, I've got a lot of other things to deal with, including finding more people to defend the town. All right, will do. And I'll make a note to find the Chamberlain whenever he does come in town. But in the meantime, I'll, like, clear some debris whenever I have free time. Okay. From the area. So you're are you clearing debris from the area or specifically the temple where it was? Just the area and the, both. It's something for him to do while grieving the loss of the temple and his mentor, basically. Okay. So keep busy. Keep busy. And there's only two other things I want to do during this entire, like, span of a few weeks. One was... Uh, to speak with the girl that I rescued from the B&B &B where everybody else was slain. Okay. And to say that, uh, well, one, get her name, first of all, and two, to explain about uh, what I said uh, about the Temple of Ignis, well, that's no longer an option because it's been destroyed. I believe her name was Lysandra. Okay. And make an investigation roll. Oh, that was bad. <laughs> In your spare time, around mm -hmm. the arrangements you're making for the funeral and, and for the cleaning you're doing there, you're looking for Lysandra, and it takes you most of the two weeks before you actually find her. Um, she had kind of been a little bit in hiding, uh, mo moving from place to place. Uh, you finally find her in one of the many pubs that's in the, in the city, uh, trying to stay warm, still nervously looking over her shoulder. But you do deliver the message, um, and she kind of nods. Uh, you get the impression she may have actually even gone to the area, but upon seeing the destruction um, lost all hope from that um, mm. but she does look up at you sympathetically um, what will you do now I'm not sure I'm hoping to have the temple rebuilt at some point that I'd need permission from the Baron in the meantime uh try to keep the flame going inside of myself as much as I can. And she, she nods sympathetically. If there's anything I can do, I know you my life. There's not much I can do, but maybe I can burn something for you? <laughs> well, I won't encourage arson, but, uh, if it's in self-defense, I, I don't see why not. Um, if I'll tell her like briefly about me and my friends, we try to help the town. We go on adventures sometimes. There is a growing darkness. If there's any information she hears, like from the pubs and everything, that we could use to let us know. I will. Where can I find you? I'm usually at the Three Bells Inn. Thank you. Uh, I'll I'll keep my ears open. Thanks. And the other thing I would like to do during the two weeks or 
few weeks. Cast speak with Dead on the corpse where the vase was found. Okay. Um, how do you expect to find that corpse? Dr. Uh, Marigold. Yes, Dr. Marigold. I knew it was some kind of flower. Because <laughs> yeah. I know uh, I did ask him last session if he had that corpse cataloged, and he did, and I asked him to keep it for me because I wanted, I wanted to ask it a few questions. Right, okay. The guy's creepy, but I mean, he got to admit he's useful. <laughs> so now that you know him um, and asking around a little bit, probably even running into him at least once or twice at the Three Bells as he's visiting Sandy, oh. uh, you do find out where he, uh, where he works, or rather his, his storefront. And I forget exactly Perfect. the name I used, unfortunately. Um, I don't think it was mentioned in game. Maybe not. Uh, I haven't. I forgot what I mentioned out of game, which is also not very useful. But uh, it's a okay, small. It. It's a small <laughs> storefront where he does have his <laughs> signs hung up. Uh, uh, chemist, alchemist, and mortuist are his uh, listed uh, listed professions. Um, the storefront itself is really small. Um, it's it's uh, mostly uh, a front counter, uh, a, a, a bench for sitting on, and then behind the counter are numerous uh, uh, bottles uh, and uh, uh, containers with uh, liquids. He has some, he, he sells apparently out of this shop uh, everything from uh, candies, uh, which are, are, are small, uh, in jars and sold by the by the pound more or less, uh, creams and salves, powders, perfumes, potions, even dried herbs, which are hanging up along the the side of the of the room. Uh, and it, his it's a very very small shop, um, but uh, he does uh, uh, greet you there or arrange a time to greet you there uh, on your convenience. Do you gather the other two as well, or are you doing this on your own? I'd probably let like let them know that I what I'm up to because it would be towards the end of the two weeks. Okay. So if they want to come around, great. I'd probably go. Oh yeah. I'm kind of free to buy it, but yeah, uh, Silas has been by to see Doctor Marigold a couple of times, so. Okay. Why don't we put? Back. Put that scene on hold then, and we'll catch up with that. Right. Um, um, we'll go back to Silas, uh, catching you up with a couple of things you've done over the last couple of weeks. Fortunately, um, with the the marsh uh, compound or village, however you want to describe it, being on the other side of Cape Raven, uh, it is spared the worst of the storms. Uh, and in fact, fishing uh, is still just as good as it was before. Uh, the town is both happy and a little bit more suspicious, if that's even possible, of the great harvests, given that uh, few other boats can really dock all that well. Uh, the water outside the bay is still choppy. That first week is probably the worst of the storm. After that, it settles into frequent mists and the heavy clouds. Um, the uh, the errant widow actually does make its or actually do, does not make its way into uh, the uh, the dock, having seemingly sailed out to sea, and no other ships arrive during that two week uh, spread. So what are, what is Silas up to? Um, yeah, he spends a lot of the two weeks uh, at the village. Um. One, he wants to find out who his aunt and uncle think the cult's enemies are because they had referred to people who were a problem uh, bef when he talked to them before the attack. And he's wondering who they mean by that. So he's going to confront them, or how is he going about that? Um, He's basically going to find the time to uh, talk to one of them and just ask them directly uh, as I, who are the, the cult's enemies? Uh, 
you referred to them before, but I'm not sure who you mean by that. So, Odiga or our, our Athenos? Uh, he would go to Odiga. She's really the one in charge. Okay. Um, she's back at the homestead on this particular day, um, looking at different uh, lists, probably working the, the, the finances, essentially, uh, seeing, tracking the harvest, seeing where the people have been going. There's a map of the waters nearby out as well, where she's uh, kind of making uh, notes on paper, and there's different numbers, which you know to be essentially where the, uh, the boats find the, the best harvests. Uh, part of what she's done over the years is kind of tracked this um, as it changes and shifts and as new things are discovered. Um, and she smiles, um, I can't say pleasantly. Um, there's something about Odiga which seems to avoid pleasantry directly. It's more accommodating, I suppose, the smile. And when you ask her uh, directly, there's there's uh, no one else in the room uh, at, the, at the, that particular time. Um, and she simply smiles at you and says, that is not one of your concerns. You have a role to play, and we will all make sure that your role is fulfilled, but the specifics aren't needed to be known. It's actually better if you don't know. It protects you. As the, as the clan's harbinger, it is, of course, something I need to know who the, the clan's enemies are. How am I expected to assist and protect them if I don't know who to assist and protect them from? But see, that is the danger of being the harbinger. If you were told these things, then that would remove the very position you hold. You must uncover, uncover these things for yourself. If we were to tell you this, it would be a disaster. So don't worry about it. We have it well in hand. And we anxiously await what you discover. Hmm. Okay. He'll sit with that. Um, he will spend some time uh, with his closer family. And uh, likewise, he will try to find out from them who they believe that, or who they think the cult's enemies are. Okay. Make an insight check. As you speak with the others in the in the uh, clan, nine, nine. Okay. Just gotta open up my sheet here. A lot of the clan are still pretty shaken up over what's happened. Um, despite the, the, the sense in many ways that it happened over there, uh, and there's a distinct sense of Elthvater as being over there. It's, it's nearby. It's a necessity. We have to do our trading there. We travel there all the time. But we're here. This is our place. This is where we uh, exist, and we are definitely different from them. Despite that, there's still a sense of a familiarity. A few of the people who are in the clan did actually come from Elthvater. Uh, in particular, I think uh, Gwen uh, actually comes from uh, Elthwater, although her family has long since moved away. There's some sympathy. There's some, there's some uh, concern. Mo the few that had gone out um, to the town that night, and there were a few of them that had gone out, mostly kept in the background. They didn't go to fight. They went to help people to get inside. And the people like uh, Viv and Gwen were more involved in making sure that people weren't out on the streets, that before everything uh, happened, they were going and trying to convince people to go inside, and as things in ha were happening, they were practically shoving people inside. So you get a feeling that, that the few of the Marsh clan who were out um, that you talked to uh, were specifically trying to make sure that people were kept safe. They weren't involved in things. 
Uh, a few of them seem to keep quiet about the specifics about where they went. Um, but there's no real, um, no real indication that they know anything more. And they don't, uh, they don't think of anyone as their enemy. Or they're just not saying. It's, it's more of, we are distinct from them. And so anyone from Ilthvater could be considered an enemy. Because okay. they go after them. Uh, they are suspicious of the Marsh clan. They are all potentially people who could get turned against. And you can kind of almost hear Odiga's voice in the background having reinforced this mes message of us and them, um, that while they may on the surface deal with folks from Elthvater, the people from Elthvater don't understand them, and they will never understand them, and they cannot understand them. Uh, they are so far above the people from Elthvater uh, that uh, there's, there's no way that they can bridge that gap. Um, again, Gwen kind of seems the least convinced of that, having come from Elthvater. And there are a couple of others, as I said, who who have relatives there, essentially. Um, but they understand this, this separation, this distance. And they also, for the most part, all, all believe in the, the strength of um, the, the Great Mother and how it has blessed this village, blessed these people, uh, and now seems even more blessing, uh, given that their, their crops of, of fish are still plentiful, while the fishermen, mostly of Ilthwater, can't even get under the water. It's too dangerous. Yeah. Um, just from the general feeling of being on there, how do they feel about Silas's decision to betray the Sea Devils and protect the town? Uh, how does Silas sell it to them or tell them this? Um, well, we had that uh, discussion before the attack with uh, I think Odega and Athenos were there and a bunch of the other people from the village um, where he had said that he didn't believe this was uh, going to be of any help to uh, Mother Hydra and it could help us to get closer attached to the town. Um, but do you try to make them feel better about this decision or just kind of try to feel them out or he's just trying to feel them out okay uh, he's fairly positive about the decision but he's he does want to see how they feel about it okay um for that there's mixed feelings um for the most part there is a loyalty to your position that has been reinforced again by Odega and Athanos uh, that more or less suggests that they believe that your visions are the true visions, however they must be interpreted. However, that having been said, you do get the sense that some of them feel that the Sea Devils were probably closer allies than the town were and are uncertain okay. about whether they've made two enemies now as opposed to having sided and created uh, an ally. Okay. Um, was it, uh, was there, a, like there's, what, 30, 31 dead. Uh, how did the town handle that? Uh, was there like a mass... Uh, funeral service or is that so, that's the kind of thing that you have to deal with the bodies before sickness starts to spread mm -hmm. uh, so how does I with the constant rainfall what is the town doing uh, about that do they try to actually have her like burials and a funeral uh, do they dig a big hole and dump the bodies in um, for the most part, nothing. For the most part, people seem to have just simply tried to ignore it all and have not made any big public ceremonies whatsoever. The bodies were removed from the streets. You're fairly certain that Dr. Marigold was responsible for that. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but there was no no general ceremony, no anything. Um, you also get the feeling, at least for that first week, that everybody's still on guard, that they expect an attack to happen at any time. And so people don't stay out in the streets for any more than they have to. The places are locked up tighter. Uh, more people are carrying makeshift weaponry. Um, there are fishermen who are carrying uh, large uh, hooks that they would normally use to haul fish on board a ship or haul their nets in. Uh, but now they're kind of carrying them around, uh, brandishing them almost like weapons. People don't want to be outside in, in any less than three or four people at a time. Uh, and anybody found outside on their own is quickly running along. For the most part, they're trying to just move on and forget. And whatever grieving or whatever uh, uh, acknowledgement of the dead is happening behind closed doors. Okay. Um, and while he's... Uh, this sort of leads into what um, Medrick is doing. Uh, as he was hanging around with Barragold, uh, trying to sort of see what kind of person he was and see what he does. Uh, he will inquire how Marigold is dealing with that many bodies. Does he have some sort of cold room or something? Uh, okay. Um, how does he broach that conversation? Well, after they're talking about stuff and he's in, like, I mean, he would just be openly asking, well, oh, how do you do this? How, like, where did you learn that? Uh, is it, there were like 30 some bodies. How are you dealing with those? This is a tiny shop. You just straight up ask him. Okay. Um, he would smile broadly. Um, I have more facilities than just a simple place. This is, this is my shop to sell things and to mix the business would be inappropriate for most. But I have a, a, a good enough facility to take care of it all. Some of it was already here. I've simply moved in. Okay. Um, uh, just a side note. Um, uh, as I mentioned, out of game, uh, Silas is getting one of the uh, people from his village uh, to teach him guitar. Okay. Other than that, I mean, he, he'll spend time in the town uh, doing uh, entertaining as he normally would. So. Um, and that, that pretty much would be it. Okay. Let's say that it is uh, uh, Luther who is teaching you guitar. Uh, Luther is Mira's husband. Luther Glass works on one of the boats. Uh, has a surprisingly deft finger even after uh, hauling... Uh, nets all day. Sure. Oh, and oh. Dr. Marigold would say that he, he studied in, Par in Pitajun. There's quite an extensive facility there, although they're picky about some things. What sorts of things? Uh, there's certain studies which they frown upon it's mostly just superstition studying the dead they take it not particularly it's more of the, the chemical process of the living it's really hard to study of course and well it, it makes my work doubly hard I can understand that I thought you might. Um, what is Dr. Marigold's favorite po favorite potiony thing to make? <laughs> like, what's what's his main what's thing? his favorite color? Mm. Uh, a lot of the the things that are available in his shop are um, basically pain pain relief in different forms. Um, so there's there's creams for getting rid of stiff limbs. Uh, there's ones to cover burns, like rope burns, that is. Uh, there's also ones that are there for um, uh, relieving back pain, arthritis, uh, that sort of thing. Um, he also sells okay. a few perfumes as well. Uh, there's one called Field of Dreams he seems particularly happy about. Uh, and 
he describes it with florid terms, quite literally, uh, as smelling like a uh, a a full meadow of uh, beautiful flowers. It's harder to kind of pick that out from the scent, but it is a complicated scent, and he finds that he can sell that one to anyone trying to make an impression. Um, some of it is is sold to caravans as they go through. He admits that he doesn't sell a lot here. He does sell a few uh, 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 potions uh, for healing, for example. Uh, he does claim to have a, uh, a a love potion, but he's very restrictive about how he gives that one out, uh, and always makes sure to extract an, a, a guarantee that it's not going to be used for any ill intent, but only to enhance that which is already there. Uh, Good idea. Um, yeah, I think that would be it for for Silas. Okay. Up until we get to Medrick's thing. And I mentioned that he sells oh, there's candles and herbs, and uh, yes, I mentioned the powders as well as candy. So it's quite a variety uh, store, to be honest. But all things that he makes. How about Annie? What's Annie been up to for the last couple of weeks? She would probably um, try to help as much as she can. Just in general. Like, help the captain if, if there's anything that she can do. Uh, stuff like that. Um, there's nothing in particular that she's attached to this place, so there's nothing... She'd help Medrick set up his thing for, for the flame keeper and just try to be useful. Okay. Uh, after the first week is over, um, you are talking with Gaetano, actually, in the, uh, in the Three Bells. Uh, and he's been also pitching in where possible. Uh, when uh, a very soggy uh, pair of people come through the door... Uh, one, a young, skinny uh, man with uh, very darkly tanned skin. Uh, the other, a um, where are we here? Uh, the other, a slightly blue tinted skin. Uh, you're thinking probably half elf. Uh, there's something very distinct about elves, uh, but uh, definitely favoring uh, an elven look as well. Uh, they come in, and uh, he roars with joy and greets them very friendly, uh, friendly, anyway, uh, and introduces them to you as uh, Loan uh, and Gwynol. Loan being the young boy and Gwynol being uh, the half-elf woman. Uh, invites them over to the table, and it becomes very quickly apparent through the discussion uh, that Loan is actually a rigger on board the Errant Widow. And Gwynol is the cook, among other things, uh, and who kind of uh, keeps being more urgent about leaving. The two of them have walked um, from where the errant widow actually made landfall, uh, quite a bit southward, outside of the storm and beyond the uh, dead man's fingers. Um, and Gwynol is concerned to get back because before Jeet has made a mess of my kitchen. Um, Jeet being a, clearly another another crew member. Um, the storms by now have started to settle into that simpler routine. The water's still choppy out, outside. Uh, but uh, they re relate how they had tried to sail in further to the dock after it seemed like that initial strike had happened uh, and kept getting rebuffed by the wind. It was too strong for them to sail inward. Um, so they actually took a very large um, uh, curve around the storm uh, until finally they ended up below the, the lighthouse. Thankfully, the lighthouse had been on, and uh, it guided them away from the dead man's fingers. And they made landfall uh, with the ship now currently docked off of the shore. Uh, and then they, they walked here, and it took a couple of days to walk here. That's how far away they happened to be once they finally made landfall. Um, they're trying to decide what to do next and Gaetano looks a little bit embarrassed but also uh, determined uh, and tells you that I'm, I'm going to have to go back with them kid 
I need to talk with the captain, and we're going to have to figure out what we do next. I've got some other things I'm supposed to get doing, get to. I, I don't want to leave you here alone, but I'm going to be away for a little while. I'll be fine. You better be, kid. I mean, if you're not, it's, it's my ass on the line now. And the two, uh, the two crew members don't seem to entirely understand why he's so deferential towards you. Um, there's still a very personal connection. Uh, he still keeps calling you kid. He seems to do that to just about yeah. everybody, but there's an affectionate tone to it. Um, yeah. And he doesn't tell them either um, who you are. He, he does call you simply Annie. Um, but... Uh, they leave the next morning, and so he's he's gone. I, I do need her to thank him. Well, it ain't the last time you'll see me, kid, but maybe under better circumstances. Soon enough. Oh. And the two, the three of them leave the next morning and are gone. Spending time with Captain Verandell. Um, Verandell seems to really appreciate you being around. Um, right now, the resources he has are pretty limited. Um, having lost so many guards because they were on the front line of the fights, um, they don't have the number they need for regular patrols. Uh, and weirdly, at times, you find yourself sitting in the windmill as the guard on duty. You've sort of got drafted at one point. You didn't even realize it was happening. You went there to talk to him about something, and he said, I've got to go. I'll be right back. And a few hours later, he came back um, with a, uh, a a bruised cheek and somewhat in tow to also add into the uh, three or four people that were in this somewhat small cage to begin with. Right, right now. You learn a little bit more about Verandell. Uh, Verandell uh, is from... Uh, Oh, man, I don't remember the number of the island. Damn it. From another oh, island. Uh, I will come back to that one. <laughs> uh, it's an island actually you're familiar with because it would be one of the islands. Um, shoot, where did I put that piece of, of information? Um, oh, I can look at the other thing. Anyway, it's it's it, one of the islands right nearby where you grew up. Um, it is an elven island, although he himself is a half-elf. Um and while he didn't grow up in in uh, in uh, wealth, uh, he did grow up kind of connected to one of the, the wealthier families and has made uh, his pilgrimage to try to prove himself in the world. He, he, he kind of, at one point he says, you know, to, to, to get as far away as he could, but then kind of corrects himself realizing that he kind of inadvertently just insulted this area by calling it the edge of the world or the edge of the, of the, the civilized world. Um, it's okay if his, if his superiors aren't here. <laughs> it, it's, it's true, but he still seems embarrassed about it. Um, he does inquire as to you and your story. What, what story does Annie give him? I give him... The, the line of I want to see the world. I, I want to, to travel and learn for myself about the world and that's what I'm doing. Okay. He seems very sympathetic to that notion given it's sort of the way that he ended up in this position. Um, but in in moments... <laughs> I, I would like, I, I'd be like similar to kind of playing off of his story kind of that like I grew up in the capital, and travel, and stuff. So hit the main points. Kind of use his story to bounce off. Okay, um, I'm going to have you make a deception roll. I'm going to have you make it with advantage because you're using his story to kind of enhance. But this is this is kind of throwing it on a little thick. That's a nat twenty, so twenty five. Holy crap! <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let me just... The 20 and a 15. That's, that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, and the island I'm looking for... Uh, where am I looking for? Oh, it's exactly that. 
Sorry, when it, I ended up looking up a map and then forget what I was looking up and then looked it up again and then forget what I was looking up. It's that kind of a day, folks. Kind of a day. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he's, he, he not only seems to, to appreciate your story, but because you actually are familiar with the area uh, and are able to kind of talk about some, some places you have in common, some places you've both seen, um, he, you get the sense of him being kind of nostalgic. Uh, he misses being there. Uh, as much as kind of having uh, uh, had to get away kind of feeling. Um, and I'm not having... I, I would say life. that I was um, Gaetano's apprentice. Uh, it's flipping which one of the six, but just to give reasoning for how I know him. Okay. He's a little bit surprised at that and kind of looks at you with new appraisal. Um because you, you get the impression that while they initially got off on the wrong foot, he has a growing appreciation of Gaetano. Gaetano was kind of a force of nature anyway. Uh, and when you mention that you're his apprentice, it's, it's, it, there's a definite uh, a, a shift, not in attitude, but, but in respect. Uh, kind of this, this, oh, really? Well, then, that's, that's interesting. Um, I'm not sure why I'm not finding the island. My maps are failing me. Um, Russ, Kay, New Hiddleston, Bomar, and Olaria are the four on the eastern islands. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think it actually is Olaria because it's the it's the eastern part of Olaria. If I remember correctly, I have to refer to my own notes. It's been a while. Anyway, I will, I, will, I will detail that at a future date when it becomes uh, remembered by me. Uh, the pursuit, however, of adding more guards has been very difficult. The one benefit to this time is that the, there's a lot of out-of-work uh, shipwrights, fishermen, uh, a lot of people who normally be actually quite busy right now are not. There aren't ships coming in. There's nothing to repair. Uh, and he's still paying coin. He actually got an advance of coin, as you remember before. That was the notion that the tax collector was collecting coin for. Well, now they have the coin, but they don't have people. Um, so he does um, uh, sort of uh, 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 appreciate the company and appreciate the, the help and is desperate. In the second week after you've kind of been establishing this routine, going through the different places, Medrick's making some, some progress on cleaning up the area. Uh, it's starting to look a little bit more presentable, but those houses and buildings that were destroyed, there's not much you can really do about those. Uh, but at least the roads are, are somewhat clear now. And it's clear. So like the construction crews, when they do, when they do want to rebuild, they're going to have less crap to do. Maybe, yeah. I mean, at this point, it's just the destruction crew first. Uh, and if yeah. there's ever going to be reconstruction of that area or if it's just going to be left empty, who knows. Um, at the second week of, of kind of palling around with Captain Verendel, um, you're sitting uh, one evening uh, having, having supper. Um, and... He, he may have had his third ale. You've not seen Verendel actually drink all that much. Um, but for some reason today, he seems particularly disturbed and is deep into his cups. And he starts to uh, relate to you that there have been problems that he's having a hard time dealing with. And he gets that hushed tone that someone who thinks they're being quieter than they are probably have a few more percentage points in their bloodstream than they should uh, kind of gets where he's going to sh- yeah he's he's kind of stage whispering um, I mean I'm in charge I really am I even have a paper that says so but Riemann I can't do anything with him I think there's something going on and I, I can't figure out what it is and I honestly don't know who to turn to. The Baron and the Baroness. I try not to report to them. It wasn't like that in the beginning, but as the Baroness grew more ill, it seemed to take over 
the attitude. I shouldn't say anything. But I'm very worried about them. And I... I shouldn't... I shouldn't give you my burdens. I apologize. It's... it's... I, I had my doubts with something going on as well. Are we all here, or is it just, just with Annie? Just with Annie. Uh, okay. He doesn't trust the rest of you yet. No worries. <laughs> from, uh, from having been Gaetano's apprentice, I've seen my fair share of nobles, and the interaction that we had was completely off from anything I've experienced. Usually it's the same old, same old every single time you meet, you meet someone uh, in that situation. This was completely different. To be honest, I, I brought you all there hoping there would be some difference. I, I had hoped that perhaps, I don't know, outside business would shake them from that. There was Maybe. not the story I heard when I heard this position would be available. The Baroness is a kind man, and, uh, or the Baron is a kind man. The Baroness is reserved, quiet, stern, but otherwise noble. I don't know. And now this I was told they to town all the time. I haven't seen them come to town in months. But as I said... Illness can be a terrible thing. And then there's this whole thing about the vases. I really don't understand that either. Wait, what about the vases? And he looks up at you with kind of this expression of, shit, did I say that out loud? I I really can't talk about it. It's, it's there's an investigation. We've, we've during the fight, we found a sea devil who was stealing a vase. And he looks up with some surprise. You did? You did? That's why it's... You're saying that stood out to me. Tell me, what was it about Ye Long? And he kind of ha holds his hands out. And yeah, it's a, you know, approximately the right size. And, and brown with little silver flecks. Was it? No, it was a silver or a shiny onyx. Shiny black. It seemed to be onyx with ruins on it. Well, I suppose that, that makes sense. None of the others seem to look that way either. So, I don't know what's going on, but it might be connected. It's the weirdest thing. And he's starting to slur his words a little bit. He is such a lightweight, uh, <laughs> because although the the beer that they get, uh, uh, some of it is brewed right here in the back uh, by one of the bells. Uh, it's good, you know. It's it's mostly a kind of half cider mix. Uh, you know, it's kind of sweet, it sneaks up on you if you're not careful, but it's not really strong. And he's only had two and a half so far. But you kind of get that feeling that stress is making up at least one or two more. Um, yeah. As his, as his words start to slur. It's, it's the strangest thing. There, there was uh, uh, another one found smashed outside the window of, of one of the buildings that had been ransacked. And, 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 and just last week, uh, an old widow came to me complaining about no one had looked into her problem of the missing uh, the, the, the break-in and, and, and the missing stuff and I didn't know what she was talking about I think she talked to Riemann or one of the others it never came back to me but I think five in total so far vases and not even fancy ones for the most part and not like the brown one. There was one that was just a simple clay, but it was kind of shaped, you know, and he kind of moves his hands, wiggling up and down, like a, like a, well, like you. I see. Uh, and then he kind of flushes a little bit. I mean, not like, not that you're vase shape, but that was, <laughs> it had, it was, he kind of pauses for a okay. moment and, 
another <laughs> drains drains his uh, his uh, his wooden mug i i'm sorry it's been very busy and i feel like i'm alone uh, this is not how it was supposed to be that damn Reman would just get off my back and i'm not so sure about these two new people we hired he vouches for them but i'm not sure Who are they? They're a pair of twins. Oh, they no. Finish their, each other's senses half the time. And the other half the time, they seem to be staring daggers or actually throwing them at each other. Mm. But they've brought a few people in and seem to not stab anybody that didn't need to be stabbed, if that makes any sense. Fair <sighs> enough. I'm we sorry. should get you we should get you some rest uh, rest I've only slept fitting uh, f f fitfully since that night I, I, I haven't I can do this and you see him kind of straighten his shoulders a bit and you get that, that feeling like he's running through maybe training from when he was younger or how he got to this particular position. You get this kind of feeling like there, there's that sort of internal monitor which he's kicked in where he's sort of like, what am I doing? I'm, I'm spilling my guts to this person and I can do this. And he kind of straightens his shoulders. I, I think I, I need to go. I need to go rest. Uh, uh, can I walk you home? And he doesn't realize or doesn't think about it in the moment that you've actually been staying at the Three Bells where you're sitting right now. I've been staying here, but I can walk you home. Oh. oh he kind of looks around, realizing where he's been sitting. <laughs> no, no. Um, the, the, the air will do me good. And he kind of steps and stands up a little unsteadily. I feel I would feel more comfortable going with you. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, if you would insist, I, I'm I'm not going to say no. You don't seem very steady on your feet right now. <laughs> As I watch him, like... <laughs> yeah, he's, he's wavering a little bit. Again, kind of straightening up the shoulders. If he could, he'd be doing the Picard maneuver of straightening his uh, his shirt, but it's really the... The uh, he's still kind of on duty technically, or at the end of a long day, so he still has his actual armor on, which can't really be straightened as much. Um, although he does have a, a tabard, which he kind of tries to straighten out, and you can see he's like, oh crap, part of his stew fell onto his into his uh, tabard, so he's kind of trying to smooth that out, and he da dips it into the 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 uh, cup of water there, and kind of starts to rub it I'm out. Professional. <laughs> Uh, and you you do see that the others who are sitting here are starting to notice a little bit, and there's a little bit of snickering going on around the room. Um, for the person who's in charge of law enforcement, this is probably one of the worst moments that he won't realize until tomorrow. Yep, and that's part of why I'm like at, at two at, at two as he's starting the the third and start starting to at this point. I'm like, we probably shouldn't take you. We we take you home. <laughs> And he kind of straightens uh, a little bit unsteadily, uh, offers his arm. I'll take it. And proceeds to walk into the chair beside him. Uh, and kind of just sort of kick in the chair. Who, who put that there? Uh, and then you unsteadily walk him home. The evening is cold. It's been chilly in this town for this entire time, but... There's something about the way that the mist holds the cold in. The days aren't much warmer. That sun being so distant, almost like it's caged by clouds. It can be a lot. And you see that on the faces of people as you pass by. Verandell is quiet on the way home. And you can kind of get that sense of tension in his arm. Every time there's a shadow... It turns out to be another drunk in an alley. 
Every time a distant dog barks and the echo rains, uh, rever uh, reverberates uh, along the walls, every time uh, an owl hoots from a, from a building top, these sounds of nature seem out of place, both in the town but also now here. When you escort him back, he has a small place not far from the windmill itself. And he kind of stumbles on his doorstep. Um, I will see you for duty tomorrow, I hope. I have some patrols I need to do, and I could use someone to talk to. Good. I should get you a horse. That would be appreciated. I'll try to remember that in the morning. And he, uh... Oh, morning. Get some rest. He goes inside. Right now. <laughs> um, as you turn away, you see at the top of the windmill, the light is on. Someone is there in the top who's... It's been used as an observatory because it's actually taller than most of the buildings around. It can actually be used to observe a fair chunk of the city. Uh, and you see the the shadow of someone pass across the light in the window. You look up. You're not sure exactly who it was, but there's only a few people that are that tall. And Riemann is one of them. The shadow passes away from the light. You make your way home, back to the Three Bells. Much like what was the experience on the way in, it feels almost as though the, the mist and shadow are gathering in places, taking on humanoid forms that are gone in an instant, making that extra little bit of chill which sends that shiver up the back of your spine that you can't get rid of, even though you know you shouldn't, even though you're confident in your own abilities and, and what you can do. It feels as though something is settling over this town. You thought the battle was the biggest problem. You thought that was the space where everything was going wrong. But ever since then, it feels not like a recovery, but a further deepening of the shadows. The next day, Medrick comes to you and says, I want to speak to the dead. Um, I told the captain I would go see him this morning for to help do some stuff um so we can we stop over and then go do that just so that i let him know that i'll be a little bit late yeah sure and who knows maybe he'd like to I'll come along as well because my good is saying that Raymond might do something to him i don't know why but that is what my gut is saying well, I didn't like that Raymond fellow, so I, I definitely side with the captain. You know those freaky twins that we keep coming across? The, the what? Sorry, your volume was super low. I think you what? cut it again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the freaky twins. Right, dagger throwing guys. Yeah, Raymond hired them. What? The ones working for the diamond. That's not good. Yeah. So we still have no more leads on this diamond character. Yep. Uh, so yeah, we are going to go see the captain and make sure he's not as hungover as I think he might be. <laughs> for convenience sake you step outside and Silas is walking by about to come see you guys and then we can go talk to the dead and then I'll go sit in the watchtower again alright sure the captain would like to uh, would he be interested in what the dead has to say I'm assuming Reed and Reeman wouldn't be. Yeah. Um, I think he wants someone to stay in the watchtower, and he doesn't seem to trust people right now. 
Right, right. I don't either. So. Same. I mean, we never know if Freeman's working for the Diamond. Yeah. Who knows? So, you head off towards the uh, the windmill, the watchtower, which I'm now going to rename it to be the watchtower. Because that's, yeah. that's actually what it is, but I just didn't come up with a name. Thank you very much, Marie, for saying that. <laughs> uh, you uh, find the captain uh, at his chair with a large mug of something dark and brown. Uh, and warm, apparently, from the steam that's giving off sitting beside him. Uh, he looks a bit worse for wear this morning, Annie. Um, yep. And there's an embarrassment crossing his face. Ah. Uh, good morning. I've morning. decided that I'm... I'm. I sent Reeman on patrol. Good. It was a Good double shift. Idea. He was here last night, but I have some measure of control. And then he kind of straightens himself up, seeing that Medrick and Silas are also here. Um, so if you have other business to do, I uh, I wouldn't mind if you were here later because I need someone to cover a later shift I'll be here a bit later then also I would like to talk to you about what we were talking last night because that made me think of some things that I've noticed but I want to make sure that no one can hear us he kind of glances at the, the other two uh, last night I, yes. trust, I just trust these two but I don't trust other people. Well, I've come to trust you as well, Annie. Um, Mr. Marsh. Uh, Midrick, is it? Medrick. Medrick, right. There was a typo initially in uh, the records. I'm not sure why that happened, but uh, it's going to be corrected. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it's fine um, and you see him kind of shuffle a couple of pieces of paper on his desk and pull out a quill and cross something off I'm sorry uh, Mr. Medrick about the temple I had only met the flame keeper a couple of times but she seemed to strike me as and you see him hesitate for a moment because you think that the word he would like to say is nice but the flame keeper, while she could be kind to you, was kind of abrupt most of the time to people. Direct um, and efficient. Yeah, that would be one way to put it. Um, <laughs> she will be missed, he says. Um, Indeed. Uh, At least she took out several of the invaders before, or as she passed on herself. I dare say that she did more for this town than I was able to that night. We all did what we could. I just hope it's enough next time. And I just hope there's not a next time. I hope so, too. Same. Still, I'm, I'm keeping you from your business, and uh, and he kind of hefts the uh, the wooden mug beside him. I, um, I have some of my own business to attend to. Fair enough. And we'll head up. Oh! Did oh, I yeah. Need to you? When, when do you think you'll be able to get me that horse? <laughs> I should be able to have it arranged by later on today. It wow. won't be quite as fine as my horse, um, but uh, it should be. As long as it's treated right. Of course. I'm sure you'll treat your horse well as well. Uh, but uh, Dreamfield will. Uh, well. We'll have to see just how strong your horse is compared. We will. Um, we'll go talk to the dead person now. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you say to him, or just uh, that's just you saying? 
Okay, well, you're muted, but I get the sense. <laughs> um, uh, did you want to talk to the captain? Like, because you mentioned you had to, like, talk about the thing from yesterday. Like, player, comment to player. So I wanted to talk to him about the twins because I he was drunk and we were in public and I don't want to open oh, okay, up anymore. Gotcha. I want to talk to him in a controlled environment that people can't hear us. Okay. The, there are actually still prisoners in the cage that's about five feet away from his desk. So. Right. I thought he had an office. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> yeah, there isn't really a separate office that he has. Uh, if you recall, it was just the, the one floor with those cages and a desk and then there's upper whatever the upper floors are for. All right. So, uh, on, Dr. Marigolds. Woo. Um, Marigolds uh, front door is closed, and there's a little sign uh, that is beautifully illustrated. It actually has like bundles of marigolds painted on the outside of this this cut uh, wooden uh, frame, you know, and and uh, uh, with with uh, Dr. Marigold across the the the, the uh, front. Um, Closed for the day in in uh, in kind of winding letters across the front, hung across the door when you arrive. Huh. I wonder if that sign is made from recycled toe tags. <laughs> That's unfair. That's unfair to break me right now. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, but as you stand outside and see the sign, uh, you hear a window up above in this fairly narrow bu building. Uh, and you uh, uh, see Dr. Marigold poke his face out through the door. Ah, <laughs> there you are, uh, right on time, which I think we said was morning, but that's all right. I'll be down in a minute. And uh, sure enough. What was for you? <laughs> what was that, sorry? I was about to ask, had, had you made an appointment or something? Like, was he expecting you? Were you just popping in? <laughs> I was looking at just like sneeze. <laughs> Nope, the one day we need him, he is he is closed. <laughs> that would have been right. exceedingly cruel of me to do that, but also not out of character, <laughs> but no, not, not. He's closing up the business for the day, because when he's not going to be there, he can't really hold the business. Yeah. Um, the other dude, uh, what's his name? Is, is, is probably like not good for customer service. Dover? Dover? Uh, yeah. Aside from that night, none of you have seen him. Uh, when you think about it, that's probably intentional because he would not be a welcome sight to a lot of people. His, his sort of deformed stature and just generally kind of uh, dangerous looking nature um, probably doesn't get out that much. Uh, but Marigold appears at the front door, uh, closes it behind him, locks it. He's wearing a, a beautiful uh, purple uh, silk, or not silk, sorry, uh, a felt jacket with a, uh, a, a tie. Uh, it looks like it's a, a, a black and yellow tie, kind of in, in swirls around. His hair seems immaculately done. His, his mustache was recently groomed. As Pat pointed out to me, this is basically a me character because I talk about facial hair. Apparently that's the only time I do. <laughs> Um, but he, he seems to always take, uh, take care of himself. Uh, and he, uh, he walks through, oh, all three of you then. Well, well met once again, and good to see you again, Silas. Nice to see you too. Doctor. If you follow me. And he leads you, uh, a fair distance, uh, away from here, from this building. Uh, it's like two. Or three. Way, I'll, I'll say thanks to him for not touching or desecrating the corpse of the uh, flamekeeper. He did tell this word, which is nice. Oh, that that word is always so disrespectful. Desecrating. I mean, really, what is it you think I do? I'm not there to fondle them. Sheesh. I mean, you use them to make other creatures. That's a technicality. And in life, ignites desire that when they pass, their bodies are taken care of a certain way. It's only a matter of respect. Oh, it's, it's the, the Ignean view of the cycle of life. I get it. You're born, you're born, you're born again. It's really kind of wasteful, but 
You can't talk to some people. I'll let that one slide just because I need access to the corpse. <laughs> um, I'm going to have a perfect comeback later for that comment <laughs> in the shower, usually. <laughs> Uh, a couple of blocks over, he leads you to a nondescript building. Uh, it looks like uh, it was probably a um, a, uh, a boarding house at one point. Um, it's it's two floors, although the small the second floor looks like it's smaller. Um, but now the windows have all been boarded up, uh, and the the main entrance has a very large lock on the front, a chain that runs through it as well. And it, it's a uh, he produces a, a key uh, and then continues to walk around the building to a, a lower door. Um, it seems to be set into the base of the building. Down here, friends, down here. I was managed to get this building for rather cheap. I was quite surprised, actually. Seems like everyone who had been living here is no longer living here. As in, they moved away, of course. Uh, and he unlocks a set of thick stone doors at the base leading to the cellar now i warn you my profession does not lend itself to good smells unless we specifically intend for good smells i can provide you with some perfumes but um they'll only mask what you're going to experience yeah i've probably smelled worse and as he opens the door there's this sort of Try something on your this sort of almost a visceral waft that comes out of these doors of uh, well, decay is probably the kindest way to put it. There's also it this. It smells weird. There's also it's this faint, faint smell of sewage as well that kind of creeps in. Um, and Silas, you kind of quickly realize that these stairs go down. This town gets flooded on a regular basis. It does have a sewer system, which is cleaned out by the water, which flows in the, into the town. But that's essentially the level you're walking into. Hmm. Thankfully, I'm used to stench uh, working at a dock. And now you're working with another dock. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, he doesn't seem to be bothered by it all that much. Um, possibly because he pulled out a little handkerchief before he went in and kind of wiped his nose. You're not sure if there's something on the handkerchief or just had to blow his nose. You're not sure. But he... I do get to throw up. <laughs> Good. Uh, it is difficult. Um, and for you, Medrick, I kind of imagine that that small nimbus of, of, of not quite flame that surrounds your body kind of flares up a little bit in front of your nostrils. Yeah, uh, like he'd make a face and it's like, oh. But I mean, I'm assuming he'd he would have smelled like decayed in death on the battlefield before. Yes, but this Maybe is Maybe like, not the defense, but like he had time to brace himself a little bit, I guess. Well, battlefields are open, <laughs> and this is not. Yeah. Um, but he leads you through, and you can see that additional stone has been added. Um, the walkway you're going through, um, which is actually uh, a... Not a set of stairs, I should say. It's actually a ramp that's been that's been uh, lowered down, with a couple of grooves in it that have been used uh, considerably. Leads to a stone, uh, a flat stone floor, and a fairly narrow hallway. Um, there's also a lot of cool air that comes through. Uh, the ground is slightly damp. Uh, you can hear the sound of of water flowing a little bit uh, somewhere below, maybe. Um, and the air is cool as well as you walk through. Make sure you close the door behind you. And he uh, goes over to one, one wall uh, and uh, uncovers a, uh, a lamp. Um, Medrick, you're familiar with the light spell. And there are yeah. certain ways to make light a more permanent object. This, this lamp is one of those permanent lights that he's just uncovering to light up the space. Um, okay. It's notable in that he didn't light the lamp. Uh, and you kind of feel this weird vibration across your skin as you walk in. Uh, and some of the smell sort of vaporizes a little bit. There might be some gas down here. 
Just a sec, there's a dog issue. Whiskey. <laughs> doggy shoe I'll wait for a moment for him to come back as Dr. Marigold shoes away the Pomeranian okay yeah he snuck upstairs and he's not allowed upstairs yeah. then well, he started chasing the cat and we had to stop things from falling over <laughs> terrible thing for Dr. Marigold to, to do uh, <laughs> he, yeah, he, he started, you... I could feel a certain but vibration yeah, it's it's more that you can feel the 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 heat and the regular nimbus of almost plane that surrounds you is reacting a little bit to the air. Um, there may be some volatile gas in the air here. Okay. Um, as you move down the hallway, um, you can see there are different doors set in, into each side. These are are thick stone doors. Um, they look like they're they're heavily weighted. Um, they've got large. Uh, uh, metal locks attached to each of them, uh, kind of uh, about uh, a half a dozen on each side, so only about five or six feet wide. Uh, and he finally comes down to the end. Ah, um, four, five, this one. Uh, and he pulls out a set of keys and unlocks the uh, the the big lock that's there. It should be the right one. Again, this is a somewhat closed room, so. Be kind to your nose. And he shoves open the door. It moves surprisingly easy, but you can see that it's a fairly large, thick door. And once again, there's a sort of sense of stale air uh, blowing outward with a, a bit of a smell as well, even more intense than it was before. You get the impression now that all the smell you'd had smelled in the hallway was just a little bit accumulated every time someone has opened one of these doors. And now you're in the actual source of, of the smell. There's not so much I can really do to help preserve bodies as long as I would like, unfortunately. There are some chemicals I use to try to make sure that the tissues and the skin and the body doesn't break down that quickly. Since no one came to claim this one in particular except for you, Medrick, well, it's sort of stand to see it here. I've made a, a preliminary examination, but uh, that's about it. And he kind of moves in with the lamp, hangs on a hook about his height on the wall, and you see a smallish room, again about five feet wide. In the center of the room, there looks to be a granite slab, and on that slab uh, is a a uh, glass bowl, essentially, uh, about five feet uh, long, actually about six feet long, and about uh, two feet wide, and you can see kind of floating in this in some sort of viscous liquid is the body. Um, looks like a, a, an older woman, or at least was an older woman, um, still dressed. Um, you can see on the other side, or actually on the sides, there are a couple of different um, uh, platforms with little bits of stairs for him to climb up, and he does indeed step up to one of them, uh, and uh, reaches into... Uh, uh, actually reaches beside where a pair of gloves is hanging. They're kind of, for him, their, their, uh, their elbow length uh, look like probably leather, cured leather perhaps. Uh, they look a little bit sheeny in the, in the little bit of light that's there. He pulls them on. On you, they probably only go to just above your wrist, but on him, their, their uh, elbow length. And he proceeds to... Right. Oh, we lost an Annie. Um, he proceeds to to uh, to kind of reach in towards the body. You can see that the water has this scummy look on the surface, uh, and little bubbles are forming here and there. Bodies, you see, release everything when they die. All we can really hope to do is slow that down a little bit, give us more time to examine and understand and comprehend, and I guess in your case, interact. I must say, I haven't had an opportunity to observe this before. I don't have the capacity to do this myself, otherwise it would make a lot of my business a lot easier to do, I suppose. But uh, I will be fascinated by this. Now, do you need the body outside of the liquid at all? Uh, it doesn't say anything about that in the uh, Speak With Dead spell description. It just has to have a mouth to 
you do imagine that if the mouth is underwater, it might be harder to hear. Yeah. Uh, yes, I would need it outside of the water. Ah, as you wish. I forget um, the corpse doesn't just set up with that one. <laughs> if you'll give me a hand, uh, he gestures to the side where there's another pair of gloves. Again, on him, they would be uh, cover up to his elbow. To you, they're only about uh, just above your, your uh, wrist. Okay. I'll just put them on as, hard, as high as I can. Okay. Try not to break them. They're a little tight. They're also sized for his, uh, his hands. And he uh, moves his, his stool around to the other side. Now, on three, he puts his hand in uh, underneath the head. One. Two. two three. Well, and I'll he, copy his uh, And he's just pulling her head up. You can see he's pulling her head up uh, fairly gently. Um, I will say make an uh, acrobatics roll. My sheets are all over the place. Oh, acrobatics is not that great. <laughs> Definitely not that great. Was that two, the roll? Yeah. Oh, my. Okay. I, I guess that liquid is... Uh, I was expecting water. It's not... Can I try again? That was slippery. You could it's, have told me that. It's not water. In fact, it kind of feels like a mixture of oil and acid. Um, just that's that weird sort of reactive feeling, the bubbling against the edges of your fingers where these are, are sealed gloves. You're pretty sure of that, but you can still kind of feel the stuff seeping in around the seams and it's a little bit distracting. And so you kind of jerk your hand up at the same time he pulls his up fairly gently and the upper part of the body goes out of the, out of the water. Um, it took a little bit of effort. Uh, the flesh looks flaccid and uh, but still present um, you can see large gashes on her throat uh, now devoid of any real blood uh, and the the remains of her having been been clawed to death pretty obviously you see here and he points towards some of the wounds you see this extra blackening that's not normal that's kind of interesting actually I'm positing it's some sort of acidic pro uh, uh, process. I don't know if it's naturally exuded by the creatures or whether it's something that they, they had armed themselves with previously or whether it was something that uh, they have some capacity to smear on as needed. It's, it's some sort of living substance, though. Like it's, it, it hasn't diminished or washed away. If anything, it seems to have taken hold. It's quite fascinating. A different form of necrosis than I've ever seen. I think it's a a separate being. The oh, really? their priestess had a pet that was made of it. Hmm. Like it split up. Fascinating. Well, it seems to be the keeping the corpse in rather intact form. Even the muscles haven't really stiffened up as they usually would. Which is fortunate, because it would have made this a whole lot more embarrassing if he pulled up and the muscles had tightened and the whole body would have just sort of flopped over. Indeed. Still? So just the upper body out of the water should be fine. All right. And he kind of gestures to, to have you push on the front at the same time to kind of slide the body to lean up against the edge of the the uh, sort of crystalline glass uh, bowl that's that's the... The body sitting in the liquids. The liquid kind of sloshes back and forth, that same sort of scummy surface, interacting a little bit with the the uh, the, the black goop as well. Now, how long does this take? It can be speaking to us for 10 minutes, roughly. Oh, that's quite a substantial amount of time. Um, just a second then, and he eagerly kind well, of pulls I, off his... They do exhausted at some point and or they only have a certain amount of energy and can only answer a specific amount of questions do you know whether you're contacting you know uh, the extra little bit the soul if it will or if it's just the body you're speaking to i believe it's just the body i've never done this before fascinating 
I've always wondered exactly how much the bodies remember and how much is really some sort of residual echo of the, of the being, or whether it is actually a connection off to the being's soul, if such a thing exists. I'm still not entirely certain where that fits in my philosophy. He pulls off his gloves rather eagerly, and he reaches into his pocket to pull out that thick journal you've seen him uh, writing in the other night. Whenever you're ready. Anything else I can get for you? No, just writing notes will be fine. And quiet. No, oh, yes. Okay, so I will cast the spell. Okay. And it is it's speak cool with like, dead. Well, Metric's just going to go... Like, stand. Close his eyes. Maybe a little bit of flame that'll happen around him as he tries to focus on Ignis and try to contact Ignis and ask Ignis to like animate this corpse's spirit. Like whispering a little prayer, incantation, and oof. Okay. You release the spell. There is that yeah. spurt of flame that happens when you make that connection with the greater flame of the universe. Don't forget to roll your, your damage. Right. Okay. Quite a spurt of flame uh, emits, emerges. And at the instant that happens, there is a shift for all of you in the room. The heat spreads quickly, flashing throughout the entire room. Small amounts of flame uh, emerge in midair around the room as well as small pockets of gas are burned off. In the bowl itself, the surface of the water starts to churn and shake, and green flame licks across the top of the surface. Marigold's taking busy notes. This is fascinating. Is it supposed to do that? And as you're preparing to answer the, the, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm ignoring Marigold for now because I told him to be quiet and he's not being quiet. He's definitely not being quiet. Um, he just keep writing his notes. <laughs> Silas will shush him. Just trying to figure out. Okay. Um, as I pulled a vial of perfume out of my pocket and I'm sniffing that. Yeah. Like out of. My um, it, it feels like the perfume is trying to like 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 fart in a windstorm. It's it's not really having a lot of effect, but you know it's there. It makes me feel better. Silas stands by for when when uh, Annie falls unconscious from inhaling perfume constantly, <laughs> <laughs> breathing enough of perfume. Uh, Medric, you look over with some frustration at Doctor Marigold, and out of the corner of your eye, you realize there is an intelligence in the eyes of this corpse before you. It seems to be present. And all of you feel a chill in the air despite the flames in front of you. This weird combination of cold and hot. A boundary has been crossed. Hey. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey. How you doing, dead person? Okay. Um, first, I'll introduce myself and ask... Hi. Hi. Make eye contact with it. Okay. It doesn't really seem to move all that much. Maybe it's only a trick of the light anyway, but the little dancing flames, the green flames across the, the, the water, kind of flicker in its eyes, and it's almost like it shifts its vision, but you feel the attention, if not the vision. I'm Medric. You were killed in a sea devil attack about two weeks ago. Something was... They tried to steal something from your residence, and we need more information about this object. What? Eh, shit. I'll pull out the vase. This vase. What's the meaning behind it? What does it do? Is there anything special about it? 
and I'll describe the vase in case the corpse can't see it. It's like it's a black onyx okay. ruins around the edge. I'll be fair as a GM and just warn you, you have five mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> that was three questions already. Oh. I mean, like, I was trying to, like, phrase it properly. <laughs> I, I guess the one I want to ask is, fuck, what was the third one? The third one that I said was correct. What is this vase? <laughs> yeah. What is special about this vase? Okay. Um, the jaw shifts and judders a little bit as if muscles not used to moving for some time are now being forced into animation. Uh, a hollow voice seems to come bubbling up from within this creature's uh, form. And the lips, which are kind of drawn back a little bit, they're kind of both had been drawn back and now flushed with, with fluid, so kind of a little blubbery. Um, pretty vase held flowers. Sea devils, the, the sea devils seem to be after it specifically. Where did you find it, or how did you acquire it? That that is like one question, basically. <laughs> or where did you acquire it? Bart from Caravan. Many choices. Bought from Caravan. Many choices. Beautiful. Expensive looking. Cheap. Do you remember where that caravan was from? Peter Jewel? Or their merchant's name. She has to ponder for a moment as I realize, damn it, I, I, I name everybody, but how did you pick the one person I forgot to name? <laughs> Clock. Winder. That's rather interesting. Don't you think? I'll nod. That's about the only lead I'm going to get out of her. Um, and thank you. That was useful, or at least as useful as possible. Uh, what is your name and do you want us to contact anybody and tell them of your passing and if so who are they like, your, your last dying wishes basically <laughs> your last, last dying wish is a compound question yeah I'm really bad at like concise sentences writing no problem verbally it's like <laughs> who is your left of kin <laughs> yes that <laughs> To address part A, subsection three, um, <laughs> Amelia Farrell, family so far away. And she's there's not going to say where. There's a sadness in her voice. No one came to claim the body, so I presume no one locally is all that close with poor Amelia here. And the body kind of lurches a little bit, and there's a thick, acrid smell as that green flame 
flares up a little bit. And there's a, a waft before, of smoke. Before it disappears, I'll, say, I'll tell her to, like, may you live well in the Everlight. <laughs> a little blessing as she passes away again. Okay. The, there's a, a, a sudden burst as the flames flicker upward, and then black smoke permeates the room. And the flames don't go out. But for you, Medric, you can tell that there is no animation to the, the body anymore. There is sort of melting, however, as the flames are starting to lick upward on their upper torso. Um, we should probably put that out. Did I mention that some of these fluids are flammable? No, probably, you had not. Probably should have mentioned that. Didn't really think of your profession. Um, <laughs> quick, g give me a hand. And he tries to push the body back down into the flame or into the water. Yeah, I'm assuming I'll put the glove back on, try to help him push okay. the body back into the water. The body doesn't bend anymore and kind of sits at this awkward angle. Uh, the back being kind of the, or the, the, the rump being the, the, the uh, pivot point now of the legs being slightly up and the head being slightly up out of the water, the flames now starting to lick over her face. This is not good. Um, excuse me. And he runs out of the room. Marigold runs out of the room. You hear him fumbling with some keys. Yeah. Uh -oh. What spells do I have prepped that could be useful right now? The room is starting to fill with smoke. Best I can do is a one. Spells to cause more flames. <laughs> burn, burn. Wait. <laughs> Best I can do is like splash water from my water skin on it. Okay. I hope that's not like putting out a grease fire in real life. So you oh. you throw some of the the water on the top of this. Some of it hisses away as it hits the the flames. Uh, and the rest kind of skitters onto the top, and you see the, the liquid kind of bloop and flow slightly over the top of the edge down onto the floor, where there's now a streak of flame where the the greasy substance poured down there. Oh, no. Are there any sheets around? The room is pretty much devoid of anything else. You get the impression that they may bring tools anywhere they needed, or they just kind of keep it empty. It's not that big a room. It's fairly crowded where you are as well. I'll grab my cloak, pull it off me, and just cover the flame. Okay. You throw it over the, the edge of it. Yeah, I've seen people do that on the, on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, when people get set on fire. It kind of lands across the top of the glass uh, or glass crystalline uh, coffin that's there. And you can see it kind of burning a little bit. So presumably you press it down into the liquid? Yeah. Okay. The awkward position that she's in means it's hard to get any sort of complete coverage over it. And you can kind of smell now this combination of burning fabric, burning flesh, and that weird rotten egg kind of smell from whatever the stuff is actually on fire. Um, the cloak is smoldering. It's not on fire. Uh, but doesn't seem to have put the flames out entirely. I start looking for the door and backing out of the room. I say, you guys should get out of here. We should close the door. <laughs> Silas will back towards the door, but he's keeping an eye on uh, Medric. I, I leave the room and at all. close it when people are out. Like it's not even like halting it a little bit? It, it's you, you can't really get a sufficient coverage unless you start to really pack it in over her. The flames probably won't bother you, but they might bother her, or you can try. Yeah, I'll try. Okay. Make an acrobatics check. Why can't it be athletics? Because you're not trying to beat the flames to death. <laughs> <laughs> what if I did? No. Hey! There you go. Uh, you managed to kind of tamp down and put the, the, the cloak into the liquid and kind of press down. You can kind of see where the liquid flows around the cape, that the, the flames are kind of licking up around it. 
Um, this this viscous substance seems to have really soaked into this this cloth and is almost using it like a wick. But for the most part, large amount of flames are, are out. Coming through, you hear from behind you, Silas. You see Annie, or Annie, you see uh, Dr. Marigold run from the other room across the hall where he opened it up. He seems to be carrying some sort of metal bucket. Silas is standing in the way right now, though. Does he uh -huh. see that I've mostly like, got this under control? <laughs> uh, Silas Water made it work. Does Silas step out of the way? Yes. Okay. Um, he kind of runs in with his bucket. Uh, looks up. You can still, from the 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 little bit of light that is still emitting, you can see that it's still kind of smoldering a little bit. Coming through, uh, and he he runs up, steps up onto the top of the the stairs, and dumps into the water what looks like a dark black soil, uh, which begins to hiss and bubble, and uh, kind of come to a halt. All of the motion and everything that's going on in there, and he kind of keeps pouring it. Oh, that was rather disturbing. Good, good that I keep some of this on hand. I mean, it comes in handy for numerous things, but it's hard to come by, you know? What is it? Uh, I did have that under control, by the way. Well, for the most part, it's it's dirt, which is useful in so many different circumstances. It's also so, uh, sown with a little bit of alkaline, which helps to neutralize some of the acidic uh, material used in the preservation. And... It may have also been dirt that came from a, um, well, a, a consecrated graveyard, of course. <clears throat> Medrick understood barely anything out of the alkaline and acidic part, but just <laughs> nods like he understands. <laughs> Still, it'll be a shame about her body. It won't be in quite as good shape as I would hope, but um, I hope you got your information from her. Oh, not as much as I was hoping, but we did get a lead. Uh, is that your... I do want to point out some information about those vases. A little bit, at least. Yeah. It is... Um... You'll notice I did pull. <laughs> what was that? I, I do tell you, I might have more information about those vases. Oh, that'll be good. Was, was that your cloak? And he reaches in with one of his gloved hands and pulls out the now... Uh, soggy, slightly melted, slightly burned, very definitely stained, covered in a lot of dirt, which is now turning this substance into sort of a goopy, uh, uh, gelatin-like uh, material. I, yeah, it was. I don't know if that's going to come out. Well, the burn marks will look great for aesthetic reasons. Uh, is there any, do you have any uh, water? We can wash it off right now real quick. Uh, yes, of course. Thanks. And I'll follow him towards the water, and I'll ask also, um, you, you lit up at the mention of Clockwinder. Is that somebody you know? Um, and he kind of hollers over his shoulder, he leads you across the hall, the same sort of utility room, uh, and you can see there he's actually got, um, it looks like a, a, uh, a large pipe that has a handle on top and a large basin underneath with a drain underneath the basin. This room is also filled with numerous tools and uh, glass vials and different bottles, some of which are occupied across the, the back of this room on shelves. Um, and he uh, reaches up, uh, actually takes off the glove, reaches up, op opens the, the pipe, and water starts to spill in towards the, uh, the basin. Um, Again, for you, Silas, having been here and knowing where you are, um, this is sort of the tapping into the, the if you will, the water main. Um, there may there must be reserves of water that get filled when the water when the town is flooded, uh, which he's kind of washing into. Oh yes, Clockwinder is a most amazing caravan leader. Uh, he's a gnome from far off New Huddleston, I think, originally. Uh, New Huddleston, just cycling. is an acquirer of many great goods. I've had him order me a few things in from time to time. Who was this about a vase? Then puts his clothes back on and proceeds to sort of knead your cloak a little bit and try to give you assistance in cleaning it off. He's, he seems only half aware of it as he's kind of talking to you at the same time, but... 
we're not sure what it is about the vest. It's the one I showed you the other day, the one I had in my hand in that room. You said, it's just a vest, but Ooh. without your usual cheerful demeanor. Well, I mean, if you look like a nice vase, make an intuition check. Insight? Or insight, yes. Make me as well. Sure. I, I kind of assume that most times that Annie's watching everything. I am paranoid. Creeping around. Need to be. Fuck sakes. Uh, insight is an 18. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Medrick, you see him kind of uh, squeegeeing off the, the the bits of goop which are falling into the bottom of the space and kind of filling it up a little bit. Uh, the basin itself is probably going to need to be cleaned, but you get the impression from some of the tools nearby, the the, the pointy metal and uh, somewhat scarred ends of some of these probably what were rakes at one point uh, are probably used to do this on a regular basis to clean this out. And you kind of get fascinated with that for a moment and kind of not notice his, his weird response. Annie, you see him kind of thoughtfully respond and think about the vase for a second and kind of nod his head but then say it's a very nice vase as if he, he kind of was thinking about something else or thinking about the vase or something what else is on your mind oh, well it's nothing really I suppose just in my nothing can in my line of business, you have to acquire a, a great number of different things, um, such as vases with lids on them, uh, more properly called urns. I was just musing about how that looked like an urn, that vase of yours. Not entirely different from some of the urns that I've picked up from Clockwinder from time to time. Usually, they're empty. Usually. I'll look inside the vase again. <coughs> yep, there's nothing in the vase. And there was never anything in the vase ever since the moment we picked it up. Unless you put something in there. No. I mean, you might have wanted to brighten up the room with some daffodils. I can't tell you. It's a marigold. It's a marigold. <laughs> so, do you think that this would have been an urn? Have you ever seen that design before? Oh, it's pretty popular. I've used urns like that myself from time to time. Not so much since I've been here. There's less of a preference, um, if I might say, for um, dust. Seems rather ineffective to have dust so close to the sea, I think. Often becomes mud. Hmm. Do the runes mean anything? Does anybody know? I mean, I can take a closer look if you'd like. Gnomish or halfling. Or dwarvish. Do you actually Forget speak all the languages? <laughs> Well, unless it's, you know, any of them. Um, if, it's, if it's none of the common ones, or thieves can't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is not a common tongue. It is not one of those. Um, most of them, uh, when they were made, had some sort of uh, blessing or indication of the person inside, I suppose. The ones that I acquire have very little on them, if possible. It doesn't very make it very good if you're trying to keep something in a, in a jar and it's already labeled. That one, that one has a label on it. Can you make out what it says? And I'll show it to him. Yeah, he takes off his gloves and takes a closer look. Eh, well, um... It looks a little familiar. He looks very hesitant to say anything more. What does it say? <laughs> well, you see this one? This is a name. You can see how this squirrels around. It, 
It's an old language. I only managed to study some of it back in my earlier days. Uh, there were some explorations I had made, some 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 delightfully interesting um, old. Uh, well, I, I guess they were tombs. You see, the, the ancient Athlonians uh, left behind so little of, of what we know of them. Uh, seems like they almost wanted to take it all with them. <laughs> and, and to a certain degree, I think they did. Um, but um, this is, uh, well, uh, it's a name I recognize. What is it? In what language is that? Well, it's Athlonian. I don't understand the language itself fluently. Uh, I don't think there's a living soul who does. Uh, but uh, this one... Uh, I have to find a stupid note. <laughs> <laughs> I have to nope. dig through my logs and see if I can find... There we go. Uh, yeah. Shoot. The one time I do have the name, and I can't. There we go. Um, it's uh, an ancient ruler, uh, at least as far as I've been able to determine. There were a number of, of buildings built uh, with the declaration of of uh, this person on them. I, I mean, ruler might be the wrong term. It might have been conqueror. That might have been a better term for it, anyway. Uh, but the name is, is Duagaul. Uh, properly, I've seen it written as Turaz Nakma Duagaul. Duagaul. And as he utters the name, the air grows chilly. And holding onto the vase, Medric, it grows colder. And sort of heavier. I'll focus on the presence of Ignis within me and, like, I'll picture my hand being warm. And your hand lights on fire. And the fire seems tinged with green. And I think that's where I'm going to have to conclude for this evening. Oh, man. I hope to get further, but, of course, later start because I wasn't feeling great. <laughs> um, you guys, it, it, are you familiar with the movie... Uh, Cabin in the Woods. Nope. Yeah. Uh, it is a delightful horror film that came out a few years ago. And uh, the premise is there is an entire organization which is dedicated to creating a horror scenario. But the horror scenario has to be the decision of the people who are in it who don't know anything about it. So some kids go to a cabin in the woods and there's a, there's a, a basement full of things. And everybody in the control room is watching this is going, which one are they going to choose? Which one are they going to choose? And that's exactly where I've been this entire time is which direction are you going to go? <laughs> so that I have some idea. Did you pick the worst one? <laughs> no, they're all bad. Okay. <laughs> but in any case. Uh, um, and, and after, like, if we happen to have, like, a party wiper, like, complete this session and go back to the regular session, are we going to see, like, what all the options were? Probably not. I'll just recycle them, put them somewhere else. <laughs> There's no saying you won't necessarily go through all the options anyway. I mean, it all depends on how much I feel like putting you through. Uh, but for the moment, thank you very much for joining me, folks. Thanks for playing. Uh, sorry about the abbreviated session. I hope that I will not have such a strange feeling in the next <laughs> time. We will try to once again uh, commence at 2.30. If uh, you've been watching along at home, thank you very much for joining us. If you're watching at home and it's not now, which means it's sometime in the future on YouTube. Thank you very much as well. And know that you can watch us live on twitch.tv slash ENCAF1. That happens uh, generally on Sundays at 2.30 Atlantic time. I believe time will be shifting again soon, but that number won't. It'll just be at a different sidereal, is that the word? Different sun time? I don't know how time works. Uh, but you can also catch up with us later at youtube.com slash ENCAF1. Until then, have a great day. Go find the mystery. Go talk to strange gnomes who are holding on to dead bodies. Yay. <laughs> we'll talk to you again soon. <laughs>